Yeah! Ah. Oh. Ah. Oh, good. Nothing happened. Oh, my God! Oh my god, what the hell? I don't know what to do. I just wish games were simpler. Oh, uh, if you want, you can uh, try my Link's Awakening here. I don't really like old games. It's about time the Game Boy got a little respect. I hear you, Ocarina was a big deal. Link to the Past was a big deal. But hold on, have you ever thought about what makes Zelda interesting in the first place? <laughs> Surely you won't tell me it's the triangles. Surely you won't say it's the princess. And surely it's not some ill-crafted broadsword. Okay, maybe it's the sword. Link's Awakening is a game you probably should have played by now. And it's a game I love because it's not afraid to take the table dressings and Swipe that shit on the floor. Given this game was a side project that was worked on like an after school club. Side note, please get a hobby that isn't work, guys. And it comes out in nearly every facet of the game. Hyrule, gone. This is Koholint Island, a place Link dreamed up, which is why there's a Zelda paralog character and older women kiss him. Ew! The dreamlike quality of the island is a useful cover for the game being developed with loose artistic integrity. For example, Yoshi, Goombas, Kirby, that frog guy from the one Mario game. It just steals things. It gives the game a sense of whimsy that might only ever work in a handheld game. You know, games need to be something when you're sitting down in front of a TV for three hours, but when you're on a nighttime road trip and you're waiting for a passing street light to brighten your Game Boy screen to just See, it's like, was that Kirby? Did I see Kirby in my game? That's not Kirby. <laughs> the game has a basic plot. You go through eight dungeons, collecting keys, collecting items, collecting MacGuffins, and that's about it. It doesn't innovate anything incredible for the franchise, so you know what to expect. However, this began as a Game Boy port of Link to the Past. Presumably, it couldn't fit the whole map or dungeon set, or just spun out of control during development, but it ended up original. The map is fairly small, has few NPCs in specific locations, and progress is gated via obstacles that dungeon items solve, or by socializing. In other words, the map feels more like a puzzle box than a world, and I think the game does well for it. We don't need some grandiose world and strong world building if it's a dream. You can have the hippo NPC. You can have the bear NPC. You can have the- Two notable additions to the franchise started here because of the world presented. You're in a dream? Okay, all the NPCs are weird or slightly untrustworthy. Apparently this is based on a TV show of the same era. And now every Zelda game will have just the weirdest people. Thanks, Link's Awakening! Second, because the world is a puzzle box, sometimes the devs want to gate it without putting rocks and holes everywhere. Maybe you gotta have a monkey build a bridge for some bananas. He'll leave you a stick. So some idiot can poke a beehive. And so on. I really like this addition. It's like a side quest that provides an additional through line for the game and keeps you talking to the wacky NPCs. The trading sequence side quest is in all kinds of Zelda games now. Well played Awakening, very influential move. Now this game is fairly typical aside from the weird stuff, but I want to make a note about combat. The game is pretty cool, doing stuff even its successors can't. Serious Zelda tech stuff, bro, like moonwalking. Oh! Dang old jump spinning. No one has ever done that! I guess I'm saying that it controls all loose and tight at the same time. The other combat weirdness involves pieces of power and acorns that boost your attack or defense respectively. They drop after killing a number of dudes in a row for the defense buff, so that's self-defeating somewhat, and the power drops after killing like 40 guys. Sure, why not? But ignore that, they don't factor into regular play. How about them dungeons? Progression in this game boils down to finding dungeons, finding the key after an event, and coming back later. Oftentimes the dungeons are just there, in your face, making the player wonder what's inside, how to get there. It's genuinely exciting. The events are usually pretty cool, ranging from finding golden leaves in a castle to resurrecting a dead flying rooster to carry you over large gaps. Okay, now that I'm saying it, it doesn't even register as weird. It's like, lol video games. The alligator eat the dog food. How bizarre. I digress. While the events can be fun, it can be frustrating figuring out where to go at times, and the only saving grace is the small world and small 
pool of NPCs. If you have to trial and error a solution out, it won't be that daunting, just annoying. Now the dungeons themselves are pretty darn good. A lot of them are straightforward. Each room is a puzzle or challenge. A lot of the time the dungeons are just intuitive. Like you walk into a room with a colored tile. Curious, you kill every monster in the room and a key drops down. Easy. And while some of the puzzles are marginally difficult, most of the trouble comes with backtracking through and getting confused along the way. The maps and compasses you find aid immensely, basically letting you know for free whether you've done everything you need to do in a given room and telling you what they do every fucking time. The Game Boy games did the wall poking thing where you can bomb walls but you can't always be sure where. That sounds like it'd be a problem but the game either just gives you the answer or it's easy enough to figure out with the map. They did a pretty incredible job I think keeping rooms fresh and interesting for a handheld game that started as a test of the system's capabilities. It helps that each room is a single screen so everything is immediately apparent at a glance. I also want to make a special mention of the seventh dungeon which asks Link to cause severe structural damage to a tower but it's mostly open ended so that's awesome. I usually criticize Zelda games and indeed Nintendo games for requiring a particular solution to any given problem, but this one eased off on that. While theming could be stronger among dungeons because they're all fundamentally the same but with different colors, they distinguish themselves with their puzzles and bosses. It's worth pointing out that items are actually really weak in this installment. Basically every item is already in A Link to the Past. Yeah, you can do the bomb arrow trick, but your sword is good enough, why bother? Items have specific and limited interactions with the environment and sometimes are poorly balanced. The hookshot is a really good option for combat because it outright kills all kinds of enemies at range for free, for example. Also the fire rod, like it meant something in A Link to the Past because it was tied to the magic meter. There's no resource meter here, it's just a better bow and arrow, except it comes at the end of the game. So not only do you not get to have it for very long, it's a tacit admission that the item isn't a paragon of great design. Also, not a big fan of having to reopen my menu to swap items in my two item slots all the time. Just a side note. The sub bosses are mostly wasted potential, mostly just roll over after some quick spin attacks. It would have been cool if they required old items from past dungeons to beat or had, you know, mechanics at all. You got no fucking mechanics, bro. And while some of them do, most of them don't, let's be real, don't comment that. The actual bosses range from literally the worst boss I've ever seen to pretty good. But for every good boss that requires thinking or any clever combination of moves to beat, there's an equally terrible boss that shouldn't exist. The GBC version and its color dungeon edition was cool, nothing special, but now I'm blue and have a guardian acorn at all times. Seems broken, but okay. Talking about this game is simple because the game is simple. Nobody needs to discuss the epistemological implications of the f***ing windfish, okay? It's good at a very basic level. If you've played a lot of Game Boy games, it's immediately apparent how quality this one is. It's a game of incredible scope in such a tiny package. Your goal in this game is waking that dang windfish by playing instruments in front of a very large egg, walking in, doing a maze, and fighting a boss. I'm really good, guys, look! Ignoring previous conclusions about weirdness and innovations, this game is all about shattering preconceptions about what Zelda is or has to be, even if it falls into its own tropes often. It's miles ahead of some very prominent Zelda games in terms of creativity, even considering directly lifted intellectual property, because it dares to be something other than picture perfect. That's something really valuable in this franchise. Where could they possibly go from here? Triangles! No, really, Ocarina was such a big deal that Gorons, Zoras, Zelda, Weird Alternate Impa, the Triforce, and all the typical fixings you'd expect are in place. And even though these games have nothing to do with Link's Awakening, at least they exist in the same gameplay lineage. I'll spare you the development details, but these games were made as a triad, one got cut, and now we got a Pokemon Blue and Red situation, except there's some bonus in-game content for the second game you play if you link them. Now that's some pretty sick innovation, bud. Where Link's Awakening had a threadbare plot with like two recurring characters, Oracle of Ages and Seasons has like three but really, you've got the guidance character who tells you where to go, someone to save from a villain, and some secondary and tertiary dudes. These worlds are far more populated than Koholint, and several people and cultures exist in different parts of the map. You get a world and a plot, and while it's not much of a contained puzzle box, it's certainly more of an adventure. Touching on plot, I used to think Ages was superior when I was a kid. I don't know, it made me feel more comfortable, and everything always seemed kind of easy to find and figure out. I got lost in seasons a whole bunch and remember quitting halfway through. Most of that 
is probably just how the games are made. Ages is supposed to be the puzzle game, Seasons is supposed to be the action game. What this means is Ages has less exciting combat sequences and longer, harder puzzles, and Seasons has an emphasis on physical dexterity and tougher fights. Both are valuable, and both have that sweet artistic unity. Ages and Seasons both tell their stories differently too. It might be easy to call Ages the stronger story game because hey, you get this weird Arbor Filiac connection to the tree. Hey, it's Ralph and he's gonna save the world before me. I got a rival. Hey, Varen actually gets cutscenes, unlike whoever this is. These recurring characters are nice, but they're the only real through line in the game, aside from the trading sequence. Otherwise, you're mostly bouncing from place to place because a tree tells you or Ralph tells you. Seasons did something else narratively by providing an additional mini world, Subrosia, a location built to be accessed, opened up, and explored by finding dungeon items in the regular world. The NPCs don't matter much, but you have a consistent through line that works alongside the trading sequence to create a stronger sense of progression for the player. Now, both Seasons and Ages expanded their world maps with a neat little layering technique. Instead of making a giant map, Ages did past and present. That's cool. Seasons lets you make Christmas come faster. Good. They have their strengths and weaknesses. Ages is a little more repressive, holding you back more, only letting you traverse time at specific points, which opens up as the game goes along, and you'll sometimes need to solve time puzzles through trial and error. It's not a big deal, but it's a more controlled experience. I want to make special mention of Oracle of Ages for gating progression with fun little vignettes. These toke are creepy and gross. Just you. Oh cool, you robbed all my stuff and you're loaning it back to me. Well, guess you gotta die. Ah! Seasons gates progression through the usual means in Subrosia, meaning you have a clear event to do in between almost every dungeon and, of course, through changing seasons. These are also handed out over time, and like more comprehensive reviews have noted, uh, mostly superfluous. Seasons, however, allows the player to sequence break incredibly easily, with access to the Zora Flippers early on. So much so that the world is genuinely easy to get lost in if you're not paying attention. Neither game makes progression problematic, but I hope a guide more than once. I kind of expect to playing Zelda. I think this happens because the game, and I mean Awakening 2, will often explicitly tell you where to go in a small text box and I'll forget in five seconds. A brief note on combat, Capcom makes fighters and other technically sound titles. I was a bit sad to find out I couldn't moonwalk or uh, spin drop enemies like I could in Awakening. If you could please leave my high level tech skill alone, thanks. No acorns or power pieces or tunic changing is good. They only serve to create gameplay abnormalities in the previous title and the replacement system is rings. Rings need to be appraised, which provides a good use for rupees, thank God, but it's kind of a non-system. Yeah, you can take more damage and do more, cool. Yeah, you can turn into an Octorok or whatever, but you can't shoot rocks, so what's the point? No kid has ever seen take half damage from spikes and thought, whoa. What an upgrade! It's more limited than it should be. Most of them are convenience gained through luck. Whatever, man. The dungeons are the real meat, right, but there's a complication. While they retain features like needing a key to open, finding a million little keys to open blocks, and all that fun junk, they aren't comprised of single screen rooms anymore. Rooms are sometimes four times the size of a Link's Awakening room, leading to more rooms being throwaway space rather than compact challenge. There isn't any real need for this. It just seems to be how they were developed, maybe to increase the effective scope of the games. And not being able to see every challenging element in a room at a glance, I'd argue, is less as desirable design than that found in Awakening, even if it isn't a huge issue. Regardless, the dungeons focus on different things. Of course, Ages doubles down on puzzles in a way that some other game guy would call brilliant, and I'll just call annoying by the end. A lot of the dungeons are cool, no doubt, and a lot of the puzzles are complex and interesting. About the third time I got to this puzzle, I was done. To be fair, they're constructed with a lot of love and care, and while I can't stand that seventh dungeon because it's unintuitive and irritating, the eighth made up for it with non-linearity but fairly intuitive design. I like the the rotating wheel puzzles that appear in a couple dungeons requiring the player to have good macro sense of the area. Now the items of ages go along with the puzzle theme. I'm immensely and crushingly disappointed that two of the items are direct, uninteresting upgrades to pre-existing items, but what can you do? The items all exist to solve puzzles, but the only one I think worth noting is the seed shooter, purely because it interacts with the actual walls of the dungeon. That's something not before seen in Zelda to my knowledge. Awesome. Oh cool, you're gonna fix this broken sword for me. Oh cool, I need to do a dumb test and knock beetles into pits to do it. Well, guess you gotta die. <laughs> the bosses are mostly good tests of whatever item you picked up. I think the head, thwomp, and octagon, and even plasmarine can go jump off the world map, but the rest are fairly competent. It's the ones that require both using the item and clever timing or dexterity that are fun to fight. Notably, Varen appears twice, once possessing the Oracle of Ages herself, and both require shooting seeds at her 
is switch hooking her spirit and attacking. This isn't all that clever to be honest, and you'd probably only figure out what you're supposed to do if you remembered that one dialogue box tipping you off to mystery seeds being the key. But it's fairly fun regardless. The final battle is one of the only decent, fair, and square challenges, to use a cliche. Most of the annoying fights are only annoying due to being forced to wait. Here, Varen turns into a gross thing and tries to kill you. Fair enough. It's a bit disappointing in the puzzle game for the final boss to turn into a big fat idiot and not require any real thinking or finessing. Alas. Seasons has less puzzle intensive dungeons and, as expected, more dexterity based challenges. Examples include this room, this room, running and jumping, a lot less dithering around with blocks, and a lot more gap closing in general. Micromanaging your character is a lot more important when wisps fly across the screen and lasers blast directly at you. The items aren't all stellar, and losing the seed shooter just so so ages can have a cool item is kind of dumb. A slingshot, even a buckshot upgrade isn't really worth the lack of utility. However, the player gets the rocks cape, which adds a fun element of micromanagement to jumping with heightened control and distance. The magic boomerang, which is fun to control and solve puzzles with. Super on theme, guys, really cool. And the magnetic gloves. I underestimated these because they don't kill things, but they let the player say it with me interact with the environment. You can latch onto these spinning blocks and then repel, which leads to some super fun and tricky puzzles. The boss fights, I feel, are actually worthwhile, and I say that because even some of the sub-bosses are good, which this whole set of games struggles with in general. A lot of them are mad scrambles to not die, and I think I died more in these rooms than in the other games combined. It's cool that they avoided using dungeon item exposes boss weaknesses, then do sword attack patterns in general. A lot of the bosses only require the sword to beat. Probably the best fight, albeit fairly tough and annoying, is Dig Dogger. Because avoiding his jumps, balancing control of a magnetic spike ball so as to avoid bashing yourself while trying to bash him, and being forced to kill the miniature minions is really tough and engaging. Shame the boss is another big dumb Zelda boss with a giant eye, but thank god you don't have to shoot it with an arrow. The final boss here isn't great narratively. I mean, unlike Varen, he barely figures into the plot except at the start and end of it. But at least his fight is demanding and difficult, so it's not just some giant wasted time at the top of a tower like some people I know. You're intended to play these games one after the other, in whatever order, and they incentivize this by allowing you to transfer your file over, which doesn't give you much right away, save for a single heart, but it made some NPCs from the previous game appear, and new dialogue would open up, and you could find passwords to tell certain NPCs for rewards in either game, which is also how to get the strongest sword, among other rewards. The actual content you unlock is a hero cave, which varies depending on the game. It's a really tough gauntlet dungeon of puzzles and enemies, and a quality addition to the games. The real villains of this game only come out out in a linked game, which I have to say is fairly lame if you're not wealthy enough. Regardless, the last dungeon isn't a dungeon and you fight two battles back to back. Twin Rova, who've been trying to summon Ganon, are actually pretty tough. I thought the fight was morbidly stupid until I got the hang of it, and then it's just the motions. Ganon though, like I actually bothered to get the Master Sword so I blinked and it was just over. Where's Ganon? People often go back and forth on which game is better, but it's an unhelpful way to look at the games. They're so similar, but each glorify different pillars of the Zelda franchise, and they absolutely should be played together. Whichever you like best is almost guaranteed to be subjectively decided. I don't value puzzles like I used to, I had more fun in seasons. The real takeaway is that both set out to do something in a lineage of weirdness, nailed the goal, and pushed the technology to new places. These games are fantastic, and they play in your browser, dude. Why are you still here?